Hello, uh, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it is January 9th of 2017. Looks like uh, Quora. I, I mentioned and I showed it uh, in a video or two in the past, something I read quite often. I answered a question the other, or I put my two cents in on a question the other day for the first time in, or only time in years. Uh, I can see it's going to give me some ideas uh, for videos. And I just saw that someone asked a question a while back because there's some answers already. Are you allowed to break traffic laws if someone's life is depending on it? And uh, so that is why I'm making this video. So I guess this is going to be... Uh, a story video, one of my story videos, and I'm going to try to keep it short. The, la the last video I made yesterday, I said I was going to keep it very short, and it ran to 37 minutes. But I'm going to try to keep this short. I looked at this, uh, you know, the question, and I didn't realize I had a whole bunch of answers underneath it. Uh, and of course, what I immediately thought, and what I still believe is uh, a no. But then I saw apparently some uh, attorneys further down mention things that I have never heard of and I'm sure you know they're they're attorneys so I am uh, sure they are correct but it's it's things I've never heard of and uh, I wouldn't, and of course, I think they say, I didn't read all these. I didn't even go down this far. I didn't read all these, but I, I think even they say, don't, you know, don't depend on it. Don't use it. Uh, you'll have to go to court. And I believe I didn't read it, but I didn't read the whole thing. But I believe they're saying that you would have to prove that there was an extreme necessity in order to save a life or do a greater, you know, a greater good or something, but don't depend on it. And I, you know, I think the answer to the question is, I know the answer to the question is, you know, no, you are not allowed to break the law in order to, uh, traffic law, in order to save someone's life. Now, we're not talking about uh, self-defense with a weapon or, you know, anything like that. Totally separate from the Second Amendment. So don't fucking freak out on me, you know. Uh, so I worked hospital security for 30 plus years. I uh, was a police officer. I had a full commission also, uh, which I never used for 10 plus years or more for a county, Ken Cass County, Missouri. Uh, so let's go with hospital security. Uh, there are a whole bunch of times that, I remember one time, let me bring this up first. I was working at Research Medical Center and we switched every two hours. I was in the emergency room and a nurse or ER clerk or whatever gets a call and then she tells, I hear her telling the nurses or the nurse telling the other staff or whatever that, let's say doctor, it wasn't, this wasn't the doctor's name, uh, Dr. Smith just called. He got stopped by the police and uh, he told them he was coming in because there was a code, that the reason he was speeding was because there was a code in the emergency room. And so when the, when the police are following him, so when the police show up, be sure and tell him yes, that he was called in for a code. I was, I was pissed. Of course, I wasn't about to say, you know, say anything in this circum under these, for that circumstances. Sure enough, the doctor came in, police officer came, you know, right in behind him and, the police officer asked the ER nurse or whatever, was he called, was the doctor called on an emergency, a code? 
she said, oh, yes. And Bob said, oh, okay. And then he left. Uh, that's the only time that I saw that. Well, that's the only time I saw something like that. Now, I worked at Trinity Lutheran Hospital, and there was a nurse who was coming in to work, and I don't know what traffic offense that she committed, and she worked on the cancer unit. They had a real nice cancer unit at Trinity Lutheran Hospital that, uh, for the time, the 70s or whatever, got really good results and, and good reviews and everything else. And she was a nurse that worked there, and they, it was a small unit. They didn't have a lot of, you know, staff. And she got stopped, and she told the uh, police officer that she worked on the cancer unit, and it was, she had to get to work right away for something. And I can't remember if he actually followed her in. Seems like he did. But anyway, he gave her a ticket, uh, which he, I mean, entirely... You know, he should. Um, a, the first hospital I worked at, all the hospitals I worked at, well, except for the two little hospitals, the big hospitals, the major hospitals that I worked at, parking was a disaster. No, many, no matter how many parking lots you have, no matter how many parking garages you have, there is never enough parking, and parking is a problem for everybody. First hospital I worked at, um, I don't remember security ever calling the police to ticket a vehicle, and I don't remember... Uh, Anybody that I, I'm sure it happened. Well, I remember a lady, uh, a guy who was working a painter or something, he, he fell off a ladder and he came into the emergency room. Very, I'm not even sure he had anything, you know, was, sprained his ankle or something. And then I ended up, I was out in the parking lot and a lady, his wife comes in and she was you know, fucking crazy. You know, she got called that her husband fell off a ladder and she was driving over park, you know, the wrong way in our parking lot. She was driving over parking bumpers, everything else. And I went over and, you know, got her, got her parked and she said, oh, am I? And I said, oh, he's, I shouldn't have said, you know, if you work at a hospital, you're not supposed to say somebody's fine, you know. I said, he's fine. Don't worry, ma'am. He's, he's okay. He's over in the emergency room right now. He's, I was just over there. He's okay. So... If you work at a hospital, you got to be careful what you say. But, because um, she could have gone over there and he could have gone into cardiac arrest and been dead or something, you know. Uh, the first hospital, I had a car ticketed there. I called myself. There was a uh, orderly who insisted on parking on the wrong side of the hospital in a, it wasn't an, a handicapped parking spot. It wasn't even a parking spot for visitors or anybody to park in. It was actually a parking lot by the maintenance department with a few spots for the delivery trucks and that stuff to park in. And it was, it was, had a sign, you know, and he parked there and I told him, you know, not to park there. Then I found out that uh, the director of security at the hospital had told him flat out a couple of times, do not park there. So he, the director was really, in fact, he sent me back because I, I told the guy not to park there and I told him you can move your car when you have a break, you can go and move it. I went back and told the director, he was in the office and I doing paper, putting a logging in or whatever and he said, go tell him to move the car now and I thought, oh God, I just told the guy, you know, I didn't say anything but I went up said, you need to move your car now. So, uh, then, like the next day, I'm out in the parking lot, not that parking lot, so we didn't have security there. 
I'm out in the parking lot and this guy, the orderly, comes out and says, you know, why can't I park there? And I said, no, you can't park there. There's no parking there for you ever. Not more, not day, not night, not weekends, not holidays. No, you cannot park there. That's no parking. No parking. And then the next day, I was over in the emergency room and he found me. And he said, why can't, and I told him the same thing, you can't park there. No parking. And so the next day was a Saturday or a Sunday. And when I came in, I drove, before I went, before I timed in, I drove and saw that he had parked his car in that same parking spot. So I uh, went in, I had the switchboard operator, Paige, him and he didn't answer the page or the PA system and I knew he heard it of course and I'm sure the nurses on the unit where he was and everything would say they just page you you know to call security or whatever so uh, so I called the police had them come and ticket his car and then about an hour or so later, he came charging at me uh, out in the hallway or whatever, cussing. How dare you put, a, then put a ticket on my car? And just, you know, and I said, I told you repeatedly, you cannot park there. You cannot park there. It's no parking. And uh, he said, don't you ever put a ticket on my car again? And I said, oh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I'll never put a ticket on your car again. The next time you're parked there, your car will be towed away. Uh, and then later, a young female who held a secretarial position, I don't want to give too much information, you know, there's uh, shit involved, you know how that, I mean, there's, she came yelling at me. I didn't really know, I mean, I'd seen her, I guess I knew what she did. She was only, you know, there was, okay, the controller. She was a secretary for the controller. And she said, how dare you put a ticket on? And she knew his name, you know, so-and-so's car. You can't do that or whatever. And I said, it isn't any of your business. What makes you think this is any of your business? You know, this is none of your business. And uh, that was a Sunday. Because the next day, Monday, I was doing my stuff and we had a small office just, that was a director of security's office and it was our security office. And I didn't go in there, I didn't hang out in there, I just, if I needed to get something, I went in or whatever, but, and I just happened to go in just as the phone rang and uh, the director of security answered and it was the hospital administrator. And the hospital administrator is saying, a ah, ticket should not have been, a ticket, you know, should not be, and the, I was surprised. The director of security was saying, I had told that, you know, whatever his name was, that he could not park there repeatedly. I, to I told him a number of times and, and the security officer had told him a number of times uh, the, the guy deserved a ticket and he got a ticket and uh, you know I could hear the directors and I stayed I stayed there listening to the thing normally I would have walked out but on a call you know something like that. but uh, then the director of security said yes I didn't spend 30 plus whatever it was 30 years on the Kansas City Missouri Police Department without being able to get a you know, a ticket taken care of or handled or knowing the correct way to take care of something like this, but I'm not doing it because, you know, he deserved the ticket and the security officer did, you know, did correct. I thought, wow. And uh, so, now of course that had nothing to do with for emergency purposes. I uh, went into one of my little stories, didn't I? Uh, the hospital, by the way, paid that guy's ticket. And the guy, there was, 
stuff going on of a sexual nature up above my pay scale and up above the pay scale of the director of security. So then the guy, the orderly, would, uh, he still wasn't park. He wasn't parking there, and I don't know where he was parking because he refused to impar He wasn't parking in the employee's parking lot, and he would drive by when he was going home or whatever, you know, and give me the uh, give me the finger. And then uh, shortly after that, he was fired because he was up working the unit where he worked and the nurse had the morphine or the Demerol on the tray or whatever and was going to take it to a patient to give an injection and he just took it off and went into the bathroom and then he came out with the empty syringe and put it back on the tray or in the disposable thing or whatever he did. Well, that, of course, you know, that got him fired. Uh, back to the subject. Well, let's see, that was the first hospital. Second hospital I worked at, um, Trinity Lutheran Hospital. Parking was, a, oh man, bad. I almost didn't, I went there to apply uh, for a job and tried to find a parking, you know, when I had, I was working at St. Joe Hospital, but I had, uh, I knew I needed to move on. <laughs> Not because of that incident I'm telling you about, but I knew I needed to move on for other reasons. The shooting of uh, John Gallegas and my reaction and all that. And I told that story, I believe. I'm sure I did. So I knew I, knew I needed to move on. So I went over to apply at Trinity Lutheran Hospital and I drove around and around and fuck, damn, couldn't find a parking spot. And I thought, I'll just fucking stay where I am, you know? And then a car pulled out and I pulled in and went in and I got hired. Uh, so the second hospital I worked at, um, uh, We didn't uh, we didn't call security or we didn't call the police very often to ticket a car. Uh, we spent all our time trying to find. I was when I was a day shift supervisor. I was in charge of seven, seven in addition to security seven parking lot attendants on the day shift, trying to get people parked. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, there was. Uh, Trying to think, there was when I was supervisor on the second shift at Trinity Lutheran Hospital. Uh, the t two security officers asked me, uh, "The you know the the police don't come by and they don't ticket the places out on the street on Saturday and Sunday." So if cars are illegally parked there on Saturday and Sunday, can we call the police? Should we? Can we call the police and have them ticketed? And I said, no. There's no reason for us to do that. If the <clears throat> if the city has a problem with that area, let them assign you know an officer to go by and do it. But don't call the police and uh, have the cars ticketed. A week later, I get called by the director of security. Uh, I forget who it was, a chaplain or somebody was ticketed for parking out there in the no parking, you know, zone. And administration was upset or something. And uh, I said, well, you know, we don't, the police don't ticket on Saturdays and Sundays. And I said, we sure don't call the, you know, and director of security said, well, here's a copy of the ticket and it's got Chuck Moore, one of our, one of the security officers, his, his name is on it, the officer wrote that he was called by security officer Chuck Moore. And I said, okay. So I went to Chuck and I said, you know, why did you call the police? And I eventually ended up having to, not over, not over this, 
I ended up ha having to fire Chuck Moore. I think I told that story over something else. But I went to Chuck and he said, oh, well, first he said, ah, uh, no, we didn't call the, we didn't call the police or whatever. And then I said, well, the police have your name. And he said, oh, oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, that time, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, he said, well, there was a, a chaplain at our hospital who was blind and used a white cane and everything. And he said, well, he came out, you know, pastor so-and-so came out and he bumped into that car that was parked in a no parking zone. I knew that was bullshit. So, um, and that's the kind of bullshit that got him fired later. Um, the third hospital I worked at, the police would come on to the hospital property themselves sometimes. That, well, the traffic control officers would come in and they would sometimes ticket, uh, ticket cars that were parked in the fire lane. Uh, I don't know about the handicapped spots, but the fire lanes, man, they would come on their own. And sometimes we would call them to come and ticket, you know, ticket cars. We'd then watch for them and when they showed up contact them and tell them which cars, you know, needed to be ticketed, and they would write the tickets. First hospital, second hospital. Okay, the third hospital was a small hospital, uh, about 40 beds or so, so small hospital, small town. I worked there altogether uh, 10 years, and then I left for a couple of years and came back for another year and worked there. And for years, uh, I mean, parking was not a problem there. <laughs> the hospital would have been happy if we could get people to come, you know, especially in the front parking lot where people could see the hospital. We'd have been happy if uh, people would have come and parked in our parking lot so people driving down the highway would know the hospital was open. So parking was not a problem at all. Uh, and there weren't any, uh, I never ever called the police. There was just one other officer and myself. We didn't have security around the clock, didn't have security during the daytime. Earlier I had worked a, years earlier I had worked part-time security for a contract agency. And I worked someplace that didn't have security around the clock. And then I told myself, I'm never gonna work someplace that doesn't have security around the clock. It sucks when you come into work and you don't know <clears throat> what's happened uh, and what's going on and when you come in. It... But I, there I ended up work, going to that hospital and there was no security during the daytime. Uh, except on Saturday and Sunday, I came in at 6 p.m. instead of 10 p.m. Um, so there wasn't, we never ever called the police on a car, um, but I came in after several, after working there years, several years. I came in, and I saw a couple cars that had tickets put on them, and I thought that's odd for handic handicapped parking spots. And uh, then I found out that it was the sergeant. There for that city, at Belton PD, the officers changed every few months. They changed rotated shifts, which I thought was stupid because they were terrible. You know, I debated that with uh, their lieutenant or whatever, and I think I won the debate because I'd been in that kind of a situation before, and I knew, you know, and I, I also knew what that they were in bad shape when they rotated for a while getting used to a new, sh you know, a new shift, going from whatever shift to... But I saw that uh, he was the officer who had ticketed it, so I ticketed it. <laughs> I put tickets on the car. So then he came in one time. I, I think that may be the time that uh, a car came in real fast to the ER, pulled in the ER garage. I went over right away. 
uh, with a wheelchair and whatever, and a guy was having a heart attack, and right away uh, they put him in the trauma room, and they started, you know, they, they knew it was a real heart attack, and they were working on him. I'm not sure if they were doing, if it was, if it was a code or not. So fast, it might have been a code, I can't remember now, but they knew he, you know, and then this sergeant, he was older, so I'm assuming he'd been on the police department, this, that police department. So he came in and, and the uh, guy that brought, this guy was a friend and he brought, he drove the, this patient in and the, and the police officer showed up and uh, the, the sergeant or whatever said, is that guy really, you know, and I said, of course, here we're getting again in what it is to tell you, not confidentiality of, not supposed to tell anybody anything, even to the police. But anyway, I said, yeah, I said, it looks, you know, looks serious and it looks like it's a real, you know, heart attack or whatever. And uh, then the, the sergeant wrote this guy out a ticket and gave it to him for speeding or whatever. I thought, wow. You know, why not just a warning? And I, that may be then, while well, the officer may have stayed around a while, maybe outside or whatever, and that, or maybe it was another time. But I tried to be uh, diplomatic and say, you know, I, I noticed uh, some tickets on the car in the hospital and the handicapped parking spots. And uh, I was just wondering, we have, you know, I haven't seen anything like that since I've been here for the last five years or six years. I said, I've never seen that. He said, yeah, I, I, I put the tickets on the car. We can come on private property and for handicapped parking spots, we can put tickets on the car. And I said, oh yeah, I'm sure I understand that. Uh, uh, wouldn't be much point in having, you know, the signs up saying cars will be handicapped ticketed or whatever if you couldn't do it without being called. I said, I understand that. I said, but you know, I don't remember exactly how I said it. I said, people come in here all the time. I said, one guy come in, his arm was about cut off and he didn't park in the handicapped spot. He parked out there in the in a parking lot. But I said, other people come in and they just, if they're having chest pain or breathing difficulty or whatever, even though they're supposed to have a, you know, permit on their car or whatever, they park in, you know, the handicapped parking spot. They think that's what it's there for and everything. And he's, he, man, he, well, I guess I wasn't very subtle about it or whatever. No, they're not allowed to park there. They have to have a permit and they'll be ticketed. And I said, okay. So it was, I don't know, uh, okay, this is not going to be a short video. Uh, it wasn't very long after that, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. And I came in and there was a car parked. Remember, I came in at, that was a Saturday or Sunday because it was daylight. I, I came in at 6 p.m. There was a car parked there and it had a ticket on the flapping on the windshield, you know. And so when I went in, timed in or whatever, uh, I said to the ER, uh, ER clerk, she could see right out her window, the waiting room was there. I said, I see somebody got a ticket. She said, yeah. She said, the, the guy parked there and he came right in this door right here and uh, sat down and told me that he was having chest pain. And she said, I, I called, you know, for the nurse to come over, you know, right away. And he, before the nurse got there, he just fell over and he died. He was, you know, they started working a code on him, but he died right, you know, right there. They, of course, I'm sure they took him to the trauma room and did it, but you know, he was dead right there. And, uh, I mean, I didn't say anything or I didn't contact anybody. I don't know if anybody else did or whatever, but after that, uh, no car, the police didn't come in and ticket any cars, uh, unless we called them and we never called them. So, I've seen, uh, 
I think all the other cases that I that I remember offhand, there was several where. <clears throat> no, okay, there was one I remember. I was going to say that I didn't remember anywhere. The ones I remembered were somebody came in speeding too fast, carrying somebody. Police officer, you know, had followed him or stopped him and then told him to go on. And the police officer, you know, just gave him a warning. With the exception of <clears throat> this guy, this couple guys, brought somebody in. I forget what the problem was. It wasn't life-threatening. But what had happened was outside of the city limits of Raymore, Missouri, the Research Belton Hospital was in Belton, Missouri. You could throw a rock and you would be in Raymore, Missouri. Just about. Maybe you'd have to be a really good rock thrower, but, you know, half a mile or something. And uh, Raymore responded on an accident or something or other, but actually they responded for the Cass County outside the Raymore city limits, right on the other side of and Raymore that was small. and uh, Whatever the problem was, I can't remember now, the police said, you know, you want us to call EMS for you. No, he's okay, he doesn't need, you know, whatever. So Raymore, HBO, handled by officer, whatever, they go back to the city of Raymore, and all of a sudden, 80, 90 miles an hour, this car comes racing through, or, you know, Raymore or whatever, to bring this person to the emergency room. And I'm not sure if Raymore stopped the vehicle, but anyway, Raymore followed the vehicle on in and gave the guy, you know, gave the guy a ticket because they had, you know, they had told him he could call EMS, they'd be here. Uh, by the way, somebody, uh, this person here says he's a retired cop, criminal justice professor, etc. No, there's no exception for driving people to the hospital or similar events. Many expectant fathers have been stopped while rushing their wives. That's the first, you know, line. This person says, uh, 20 years in the legal profession. Technically, yes, but I wouldn't advise it. In general, the law allows for the defense of necessity, which I never heard of, which is allowing a violation of the law in order to prevent a greater harm. This person says, uh, he's a producer or something, or movies or something. Yeah, yeah. In my case, my wife was having a suspected heart attack. I drove at a fast but reasonable rate to the emergency room three blocks away. The nearest EMS station was 15 blocks away. It was a no-brainer. I may have exceeded 90 miles an hour a brief, briefly on an empty 55-mile-an-hour frontage road right past the police station. But I am trained and used to driving at, oh my God, at those speeds. I also, oh fuck, you know. <laughs> no. Uh, this person is, okay. In my opinion, it entirely depends on the circumstances and your assessment of it. The some extent how a police officer personally feels when they think that they are faced with a life threatening. This person uh, dropped out of law school in his third year. Most common law as well as civil law systems have exceptions called necessity or extreme urgency. This allows you to break some less important rule to save some much more important rule. If there is no other way, and if you are have not caused the emergency, the danger you create by breaking the less important rule must be orders of magnitude smaller than the value you are trying to save. I never heard of, uh, never heard of that. I don't doubt that there's something like that someplace, but my God, I've never heard. And I doubt very seriously that. You know, circuit court judges, uh, min but municipal judges, city judges that deal with traffic all the time, I doubt. I knew a guy that 
he worked at the post office, and then at night, three or four nights a week, he was a uh, municipal court judge for uh, Grandview, Missouri, and he didn't know shit. He was stupid. Uh, and I doubt he knew if there's any, he wouldn't know about that. Of course, you don't get, don't really get justice in these municipal courts. You just go there and, if, you know, plead guilty or let them do what they're going to do and then appeal the thing to the to a real court. I'm sorry if I offended some municipal court judges. Um, this person here says, uh, I have worked with and studied traffic law in the United States. Uh-oh. He says, the law is no excuse not to save a life. Um, I want to mention a, a guy. Uh, the small hospital I was working at, I worked at a number of them, but the small hospital I was working at, the two ER nurses, well, nurses, and all the nurses, you know, spend every minute charting. They have to chart everything. And the ER nurses would be, sometimes, they, sometimes they'd have quiet nights. Sometimes it would be unbelievable. I would be making carts up for them and and uh, doing stuff to help them out. Uh, in the morning, if it quieted down or whatever, they'd say sometimes, "Jim, read us the news, the head while they were doing their charting. What, what's on the, what's in the paper?" You know, and I, I of course would try to be funny occasionally and uh, uh, be humorous as I read some of the things. I read the, I remember, I remember reading this thing, and it said that. Uh, a guy was arrested for child molestation in Lee Summit, Missouri. And uh, right away, both the ER nurses, and I don't remember who the second, but I remember, you know, Virginia, an older nurse. And I said, well, you know, the guy was just arrested in, you know, they, they oh man, he should be castrated. And, then, you know, and it was like, well, you know, the guy hasn't, He's been arrested, but he hasn't gone before. He hadn't gone to the trial yet. He's guilty. All the men are that you know that way. Uh, I thought, my God. So it's kind of funny. Remember that. Remember Lee Summit, I guess. Uh, so a week later, two weeks later, there was this new guy, respiratory therapist. And, you know, he was new and he was, he was just filling in for a few days and we didn't know him and he came from the main hospital or from another hospital. And he was really big guy. He wore gold chains. He had a bunch of gold chains. And he was not black, by the way. Uh, he talked about golf an awful lot and none of us were into, you know, none of us were into golf. Uh, he talked about golf. He was really big into golf. So I didn't really care for him. And so this one night he, he was there for a, in the emergency room for a few minutes. We would have, I'd bring food in lots of times. We'd have food there. And, and he was over there. And uh, I forget how it came up. He said, uh, yeah, I got, yeah, I got called in on a code the other night. I think it was main research. He got called in a main research on a code. I can't, you know, can't see why they would have to call him in when they are a trauma center and they have, but anyway, maybe it wasn't main research. He said, yeah, I got, I was going, going down, uh, interstate 70 doing, doing over a hundred miles an hour. I said, what? You were driving a hundred miles an hour? He said, yeah, I, I got called in on a code. I said, you can't drive 100 miles an hour because you got called in on a code. I said, you're not even supposed to be driving over the speed limit. 
And he said, oh, yeah, I can do it because it was a code, and I got called in. And I said, the Missouri state law states that police officers, ambulances, fire trucks may exceed the speed limit by no more than 20 miles per hour, provided that they are using both lights and siren. I said, that's for emergency vehicles. And of course, it states in there too, you know, using all due diligence or, you know, whatever. But it says, that, you know, that the emergency vehicles can go 20 miles an hour over and that's it. They can't go over that. Of course, and they, they did sometimes. I was in a 100 mile an hour car chase for a little bit until I broke it off. Uh, but I told him, you know, no, you can't do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then he left and I, I said, something's wrong with that guy. That guy's got some loose, you know, he is, he's weird. And they said, yeah. So then uh, a week or so later, they delivered three newspapers, I think it was, to the hospital every day, every morning. And one of my jobs, you know, there was two of us, but one of our jobs was to get the papers there at the front door and take one to ER, one to the mailbox for administration or whatever, and take one to the second floor nursing unit. I think that was it, can't remember now. Also once a week the local newspaper was mailed to the uh, hospital and the, it was a weekly paper and if I hadn't read it at home I'd go over to the mail room and get the paper and flip through it to see if see who's been arrested because they put that kind of information in there and stuff small paper and I looked in there and this uh, uh, respiratory therapy guy had been arrested <clears throat> Belton really did Belton really didn't have bars. They had eating places where you could get food and have a drink. They didn't really have bars because Belton, Missouri is the burial place of Carrie Nation. The lady who was uh, went around with an axe back in, I don't know, uh, 1870s or something, going into bars all across the United States and smashing up their, with an axe, smashing up their <laughs> You know, because she was opposed to drinking. I not sure if I read it or I saw a documentary or something about her. She was mentally she her fam she her family had a history of severe mental illness. She had severe mental illness. But anyway, her burial place is in Belton, Missouri, and Belton, Missouri uh, did not have any bars. But you could, you know, go in some place and, and so he got arrested out in the parking lot of this bar, eating place that served a lot of, served a lot of drinks. And uh, I didn't like the guy. And I forget, I forget what it was. And I looked at that and I went back, and later when I went back to OVR, I said, I, you know, I saw, you know, so-and-so, and I saw, I saw he got arrested. I said, oh, I know what it was, no. The, the, the newspaper was put in there and it had, it had been circled. When I opened it up, it had been circled in, in red or whatever, and somebody had written in there, I don't know whether it was the hospital administrator or who had written in there. I mean, it wasn't just some, it wasn't somebody like me, you know. Somebody had written this, he needs to be fired or whatever. So I went back to ER and I said, oh, you know. Uh, I said, I, I don't think that's any of the hospital's business. You know, he, it was after hours. I don't think it was any of the hospital's business or whatever. And then, like the next week, I heard that he, he, well, he was fired. And then I heard that he was the guy 
in that newspaper thing, the child molester in Lee Summit, Missouri, and that I read that newspaper to the ER and what that one uh, one nurse worked there in Lee Summit, uh, and that was him. The guy with the gold chains, the guy who loved golf, and the guy who thought he could drive over 100 miles an hour. Uh, that was him. And uh, then on the news, details of the the case came out. I also remember I said he was a big, you know, big guy. He had two sons by a former marriage. And I think one was like 16 and one was, I may be off, you know, one was like 16 and one was maybe 14 or something. And he had a stepdaughter. And I forget her age, but she was, you know, young. I don't know, 13 or 14 or something. He had a stepdaughter. He was having sex with his stepdaughter against, you know, she, she wasn't cooperative. I mean, she didn't, you know, he was having, he was raping his stepdaughter. And he made his sons have sex with their stepsister. And he was right there watching and giving them directions and whatever. And when it came out at the trial, uh, I forget the exact wordings, but one of the boys, one of his sons, said that this was, that it was he, that he was traumatized by it. That he it was just horrific, horrible. That he didn't want to do what his dad made him, you know, made him do, and he was, you know. So, no driving 100 miles an hour and raping uh, stepchildren or your, own, or, or your children or raping anybody else. Uh, in my mind, there is something, one other story that I wanted to tell about driving at a high rate or uh, going in, but yeah, the answer is no, you cannot, you cannot do that. Maybe if you are a millionaire and uh, you have a lawyer and it really was a life-threatening, but somebody in here makes the point also that it's better to call, you know, EMS because like this one guy said that, uh, you know, he was three blocks away but he's driving, you know, what, 100 miles an 80, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, and he's, that, the, that the EMS people were 15 blocks away or whatever. Somebody in here makes, you know, makes, of course, the, the, uh, the point that nowadays, I remember when I started hospital security, it wasn't that way. When I started hospital security in like 1972, you called an ambulance, they came, they picked you up on a stretcher, put you in and took you to the hospital, and that was it. Now, of course, uh, they're paramedics, they can intubate you, they can defib you, uh, and the guy used the example, which I've seen people come in with, uh, uh, and a phorectic shock uh, from one from a bee sting. One person I remember, and their airway was closing up. And then another one, a young man, was at a party, and uh, all of a sudden he knew he was having difficulty breathing, and uh, so he left the party. And he drove home, not very far, got to his front door and he collapsed. And uh, the they family called the ambulance. 
he was having difficulty breathing. He couldn't breathe. He was having difficulty breathing. Uh, they brought him in, and I, I was there to help out with whatever. You know, they think the ER was busy, but the ER doctor, the parents, of course, came right, right away because he collapsed in front of them, you know, at the front door and everything. And uh, the ER doctor asked, uh, you know, is, is he allergic to anything? No, uh-uh, nothing. And uh, the ER doctor asked the uh, mom and dad, are you guys allergic to anything? And uh, she said, yeah, I am. And anyway, he asked, he asked a, more, a few more questions. And I thought, come on, doc, I mean, you know, you're, or, you know, you're, <laughs> I'm thinking this, you know. And uh, then he asked her, by the way, I was in, trained and certified as a, I didn't really go out and do runs, but I was certified as an EMT, not a paramedic, but an EMT. And he asked her, are you allergic to anything? And she said, uh, uh, almonds. And there was a couple, two or three kids there who were at the party, I guess, they, with, you know, with him or whatever, with the boy. And uh, the uh, one person there, when it said, uh, uh, he was eating cookies, and they were almond cookies at the at the party. Uh, and uh, so anyway, they he was fine. Give him the uh, oh god adrenaline. Gave him whatever I forget now, uh, and so he was okay. But uh, well, I can understand. You know he. I was going to say, he, of course, I don't know if he was speeding home or not, but man, he just lucky he didn't. Lucky he made it home driving, but do call EMS because they uh, they can do things right right there. A lot of stuff they can do. Check your blood sugar and do all kinds of things. So call EMS. Don't try to drive somebody. And. Uh, there was some other situation I wanted to mention, but now it has left my mind, and it's probably the most, you know, the most important one. Uh, the <clears throat> persons, a couple of them that mentioned, you know, well, you can do, you can do such and such because of whatever this thing, which I studied constitutional law, I studied some other law, and then of course I read the entire criminal, you know, uh, statutes or whatever, and uh, when changes came out, I followed those or whatever. Of course, I guess that's way off in another section, you know, or whatever, but um, what that reminds me of, and I've mentioned that before, and it's sort of sort of related in a way. It's got to do with this: Can you? Are you allowed to? Uh, I'm an amateur radio operator. I am a radio operator. I'm licensed by the Federal Communications Commission, a federal agency. Uh, I think most of the laws have been updated now, but it used to be that there was just city ordinances, county, you know, uh, things, state statutes or whatever that said you can't have a radio in your vehicle that can pick up police calls, that it's against the law. I think over the years they updated the the, the laws and they, I think most all of them probably, well there's, of course we always hear about places that have some law about having to walk in front of a a vehicle with a lantern or something, you know. So I guess there probably are places, but uh, those laws do not apply to amateur radio operators because we're licensed by the federal government and the city and the state can't, you know, 
federal law is supreme, and then you work your way, you know, you work your way down. So, uh, we're licensed by the Federal Communications Commission, and the rules and regulations, you know, state that we are permitted in life-threatening, in, in an emergency, I'm not sure if it's we're permitted in emergencies to use whatever means of communications are necessary. I forget the exact wording. In order to save, you know, to save lives in an emergency. Uh, that that means that if that if necessary, well, I know there was a case, and I. I I wonder, I don't think this guy really. There was a case of up in the I think it was California up in the mountains or something or other, and somebody collapsed or whatever, and there was no cell phone. There was no cell phone service. But a ham, the ham radio operator was there, and he had a radio, and he got onto the police frequency. And called the police and reported the emergency. I don't know how that came out, but the police department was not happy at all. Not happy at all. And I don't know how the how the thing came out. Uh, if the if there really was no if this guy really the guy who collapsed better have really had an emergency not just passed out from drinking too much, although you can drink too much and you can die from alcohol intoxication. Uh, you can also die from drinking too much water, I hear. I would never know since I don't drink water. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, there's things that you could, you know, in say a hurricane hits Louisiana and wipes out all communications and of course ham radio operators set up nets and that type of stuff if necessary this is the kind of thing you don't you know say all the radio AM radio stations are taken out there is no AM broadcast station and there are people who their only means to know what's going on is an AM radio station a ham radio operator could, if it was if it was necessary, emergent, you know, an, an emergency. A ham radio operator could transmit, start transmitting on the AM broadcast band. Uh, not music, <clears throat> but you know, life information. You know, so you can do things like that but oh man you don't want to because there are also rules about not transmitting on you know that but theoretically and it has been done but you're going to have whatever agency or whatever that you are transmitting on their frequencies or in their domain or whatever you're going to have them coming after you <clears throat> there are even I think the some of the radio clubs actually print up a a card for their members because <clears throat> it would be a good idea to have it that's <clears throat> intended because you may get, quite often you'll get stopped by a police officer who all he knows is that you know you can't tune you're not allowed to tune in uh, in your car to police calls or whatever and if you have a radio they can do that he doesn't know the rest of you know he doesn't know that uh, he may know that the law will state uh, that if you have a permit from the chief of police or the fire chief uh, to do so that you are but he may not know that the, you know the rest of the thing says you know this law does not apply to uh, amateur radio operators who are exempt from him you know he, he may not know that and so maybe a good idea to to have that so you could you know show it to him uh, 
I think I did this way too long and I think I went all over the place and uh, I think the one thing I wanted to get to uh, was pushed from my mind. So I don't know if you can tell or not, I switched monitors again. This is my Asus 27 inch I think and it's uh, so it's going to look a bit different to you, uh, 1920 by 1080, before you've seen the videos, and it's been a 25 something, I think, by 1800 or whatever uh, display. So this may be a little, uh, might be a little better for you, I don't know. We'll see. Let's check CNN, since I'm, you can always stop if you're... Nobody's holding a gun to your head making you, right? GOP leaders moving faster on replacing Obamacare. Uh, Trump is still, I guess, uh, Meryl Street uh, did tweet it or did something and now he's on Twitter answering, you know, criticizing her. North Korea threatens to fire a missile. Oh, man. Manhunt underway for Orlando cop killer. Orlando police officer shot to death. Sheriff's deputy dies during manhunt. Hundreds of law enforcement officers scoured Orlando on Monday for a man suspected of fatally shooting a police officer searching door Master to door. Sergeant Deborah Clayton uh, grew up here and Fuck. she deeply cared. Fuck, why does CNN do that? After the shooting outside of Walmart, the sus suspect fled in a vehicle, fired shots at pursuing officers, abandoned his vehicle, carjacked another. The man ditched the second vehicle a little later and ran into an apartment complex where the search was concentrated. Later in the day, an Orange County Sheriff's deputy searching for the suspects was killed when his motorcycle collided with another vehicle. The police officer shot to death was identified as Orlando Police Officer Master Sergeant Deborah Clayton, 42, a 17-year department veteran who was married and the mother of a college-age son. Uh... Okay, <laughs> new subject. No, I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about that. It's, uh, police officer, I'm going to talk about sometime if I don't forget it. Police officers responding to situations, emergency situations, you know, at high rates of speed and, uh, and stuff like that. Don't talk about that. I actually, well, let me give you a little tidbit. In Kansas City, Missouri, uh, the dispatchers, if something is, I don't want to say minor, nothing can be minor, I think it's are, but you know, I mean, some things they just dispatch, you know. One uh, thirty, uh, that'd be a sergeant. Uh, One thirty-two, respond to Trinity Lutheran Hospital emergency room. Uh, Security is holding an arrest for uh, of a trespasser. And then uh, beep. A report of someone breaking into cars and such and such. You know, then there'd be beep beep. Bank alarm. Arb robbery reported. Blah blah blah. You know, and then there is 
beep, 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 assist the officer. And every officer around and even some way far away that shouldn't, they all floorboard it. They're driving, they drive up over curbs, they do the fucking, you know, and I've seen, I've seen that happen. And I had it uh, at least once and I wasn't a police officer, I was a security officer at Trinity Lutheran Hospital. I had that happen. The, the dispatcher, you know, they put it out as beep, 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 assist the, assist the officer. And I was very embarrassed. Well, it happened, happened another time. Uh, that time on the, that I was embarrassed or whatever, Three guys grabbed some stuff out of surgery and took off running out the front door of the hospital and they were like a fucking block away from me. And uh, the other security officer uh, said, Jim, they stole something from from uh, from surgery. They stole, stop them, stop them, stop them. And he was yelling and I turned my radio down because those guys were like <laughs> maybe half a block. And I, hey, can I help you? No, no. I said, C I want to talk to you. Come on back here. No, we saw a dead body. We don't want to, you know. I said, come on back. I need, and I, they let me, and then I, I arrested all three of them. <clears throat> um, and I still had my radio turned down. Well, uh, the officer couldn't get me on the radio. No answer from me. So he called the police and they put it out, beep, beep, beep. So I had these three in the emergency room, a little waiting room there. <clears throat> and police officers come running in with shotguns and everything else. But uh, now the other time I remember, I was, on, I was in the security office on the sixth floor, right across from the elevator, and there was a doctor, anesthesiologist, there at the elevator talking to the father of a young man, an adult, you know, but talking to this. And uh, the father or whatever starts screaming, no, no, you can't, uh, you can't operate on him, you can't do this, you can't do that, yelling and screaming and thrashing around or whatever. I went out and another security officer went out and, you know, you know, sir, calm down. Everything's going to be, you know, whatever. And he started thrashing around. And so <clears throat> we uh, tried to get him on the elevator to get him off of the sixth floor and to get him out of the hospital. And his leg kept hitting the electric, you know, <laughs> the door on the elevator wouldn't close. Well. A female security officer, while we were wrestling with him, she comes by and she loved to call the police. She she liked the police. She liked the police a lot. And she said, I'll call the police. I said, no, the police don't call. The police have already been called. And I don't know what number she called, whether she called, I'm not sure they had 911 then. I don't know what number she called, but she had some numbers that I, that none of us probably had, phone numbers. So she made some kind of a call. So we're on the sixth floor. There is a Baltimore landing on the third floor that you can come into a lobby on the third floor. The police had come in there and were at the elevator. And this guy, you know, was screaming and it was, you could hear him through the entire hospital. I guess the elevator shaft helped a little bit with that, but you could hear him everywhere and he was screaming at the top of his lungs and fighting. And uh, so the police came in. So I'm sure what happened is the police that came in, you know, said, you know, we're 1023, arrived at the scene, you know. Well, other police officers 
came into the Baltimore entrance of the hospital. I think I have, it doesn't matter, streets reversed. Came in at the first floor entrance and they're there. And so they hear the screaming or whatever. I'm not sure whether, and they think their officers are involved and they think their officers need help and they can't get to them and they don't know what in the hell is going on. So they, they're on the radio and so Police officers were coming with sirens screaming from all over. And why did I tell you that story? Because I want to keep you here as long as I can because the longer you're here, the more times you're going to watch a commercial and I will get some money. I'm not sure. See, I don't see. I, I pay for uh, YouTube Red, $10 a month. I don't see any ads on any YouTube videos. All the YouTube videos that I watch are ad-free because I pay $10 a month. Plus, I get other benefits. I don't remember what they are. I don't use them, but I get them. So, if you watch a 30-minute video or 45-minute video of mine, do you see more than one advertisement? I don't even know. Anyway, thank you very much for watching.